Okay, we've got a very lengthy reading this evening. It's all of chapter 18. It's kind of one big story, one big event. So we will uh, start that process here. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 18. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 27. So Exodus 18, starting in verse 1, says, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her sons. The name of the one was Gersham. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other was uh, Eliezer. For he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses... Uh, sorry, and when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, uh, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrificed to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people. The people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for all the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me and inquire of God when they have a dispute. They come to me and I decide between one person and another. I make them known, uh, make them know the statutes of God. And his laws. Moses' father in law said to him, What you're doing is not good. You and the people will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws. And make them known, uh, make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs, of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter. They shall decide themselves. So it will be easy for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all the people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel. And made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. 
Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. And Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. All right, so what is the situation that Moses is facing kind of in this big whole story here? He tried to do everything himself. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to do everything himself. Um, do people ever do that today? Yeah. Ever, ever, ever try to do everything all themselves? Yeah. So Moses is trying to do everything himself. Now, did God make Moses the leader of the people? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, right? Moses is not um, taking upon himself um, authority that he shouldn't have. I mean, he's, he's, he's a leader. God made him leader of the people. Is he doing what God wants him to do? What do you think? Is he doing what God wants him to do? He's doing there's what he knows efficient to do. Efficient ways to do things. Yeah, there's efficient ways to do things, and there's inefficient ways to do things. And okay. uh, even though God didn't specifically tell him to delegate authority, uh, when you're dealing with that many people, it's the prudent thing to do. And, and thankfully. God must have agreed because he didn't strike it down. <laughs> yeah. So, so Moses is definitely um, judging among the people. He's um, representing them before God, telling them the commands. Listen. So all of that kind of stuff, his leadership role, all of that is God given. Um, the, the way in which he does it has kind of been mentioned is, is up for discussion, but um, Simply the, the authority that he has, he's really doing what God has called him to do in a, in a very general sense. Now, when his father-in-law comes along, um, what does his father-in-law say after he kind of observes all this? We're kind of, we're kind of uh, Tom has kind of moved us into this area, but what, what, is, what does his father-in-law think? And what, You're killing what yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, uh, you're killing yourself is... Um, one man can't do it all. And what's the advice that he offers him? What's he offer? What's he, what's he tell him that he should do? Well, to seek out people that put him over this uh, groups of people. Yeah. Yeah. He wants them to, uh, to pick out um, some people. Now, is he to just randomly pick out some people? Like, Hey, just pick out a bunch of guys, throw them in the air. No, he asks, he tell he gives him instructions on the type of people of character that he wants to be judges with him. Okay. What what's the what are the, the kind of character qualities we could say the requirements for the job position that's kind of being presented here? What what are those character qualities? Select capable men from all the people, men who fear God. Trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. Okay. So the first, the first um, quality. Somebody want to say something? Okay, I thought I heard someone trying to chime in. Um, the first quality there is that they're capable. So it's not just anybody. I mean, Moses would have to know that these men are capable. Now, how he would know he must have had experience with them in some form or fashion. Uh, you can't know somebody is capable of doing something if you don't know them, can you? Not if you don't know them. Yeah, I mean, there's no, they didn't have a resume back then, right? It wasn't like, you know, people were coming to Moses saying, uh, here's my resume. I've got seven uh, references here. I, you know, I worked under Pharaoh and his command. You know, none of that kind of happened. So he has to know these people in some fashion. He has to know that they uh, are capable. Uh, I think that's an important Important quality because somebody might want the position right you, you could have somebody who would want the position but maybe is not capable could that happen could there all the time somebody? all the time yeah especially in leadership right you could have people who desire to be leaders but maybe are not capable and, and maybe not for any bad reasons you know like they're sinful wicked people but 
They just, they, they don't have the ability to do the job. Um, you should never hire me to uh, work on your car because I'm going <laughs> to break it. Okay. I just tell you right now, I'm, I'm incapable of working on vehicles. I bring them to the garage and then I complain about how much they charge me. So <laughs> that's what I do. Um, but I, so I'm, I'm incapable of that. And listen, the reality is that all of us are just not equipped to do everything. There are some things that we are and some things we aren't. And so here, the first thing I think we should, we should notice is the ability that these men are capable men. What's the next thing that, that it talks about? Because there's at least three here, but what's the next one? Teach them the rules. Okay, teach them the rules. But what about the quality? What's another quality for these leaders? Oh, God-fearing. God-fearing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that they're God-fearing. Um, why in the world would that be important? That'd probably be the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I started saying you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I know sometimes it's a, it's a no brainer, but I mean, you know, we got to stop and think about this sometimes. Clearly Israel is meant to be a nation under God. They are meant to be a, a nation that has God as their king. And so if you have somebody who doesn't fear God, then they're, they're not going to be a good ruler here. Um, they're not going to be a good judge, we could say, uh, someone with authority. They definitely need to be those who would fear God. Um, and you could see that in a person, couldn't you? That, that, would, that would come out in their, maybe their day-to-day -day activities. You, that's something you could perceive in somebody, just like maybe if they were a good administrator, you know, capable in some of these other areas. Is, is it true that you could... You could see if somebody was a God-fearer, maybe in their day-to-day -day interactions. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I think I think, I think you can. I mean, we could talk about what that might look like, but I think that would be something that would be visible. Um, and then the, the third one was, uh, it was trustworthy uh, and the idea of not giving uh, into bribes, right? Um, What's the problem if somebody is in a position of authority, a judge who decides disputes? What's the problem if they're keen on taking bribes? They can be bought. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what happens to the poor? They pay. Well, the poor may not be able to pay, at least monetarily, but they're going to pay if, uh, if they're on the other side of that bribe. You know, you got the, the, it, it really becomes the wealthy become right. Isn't that, wouldn't you say that's true? If you could be bought with a bribe, then the person who has the most money is going to walk out a winner. Uh, you know, the case is decided between, you know, me and Luther and Luther's got, you know, $2 million and I got two cents and he's able to bribe the judge. Luther's probably going to win. Uh, so we don't want that. We, and, and what is this character? like a person who can't be bribed what's the character quality who are they like it should be a no-brainer this is like a basic bible question they're like god I mean, <laughs> they're like god yeah. yeah yeah because god is not a respecter of persons he can't be bought he can't be bribed he shows no partiality so that's what we're looking for right we're looking for godly men who are capable uh, men, who fear God, trustworthy, uh, upright individuals, because the task they have is important. This is very important task that they have. So these are the qualities. And this is what, this is what Jethro says uh, should happen. So this isn't even like an Israelite or, or Aaron coming up to Moses, something like this. Uh, here is a man who very well may be a, um, a pagan uh, idolater. I mean, he talks yes. about other gods here. Uh, we don't necessarily know all the details, but it's possible. Um, so, and James, can I ask a few questions about that? Sure. We see that he's uh, a priest of Midian, which I am assuming is some type of other god. But Jethro then later 
in verses 9 and then again in verse 11. He recognizes, he takes delight in all these good things the Lord had done for Israel. Now, I don't know if that's particularly because it's his son-in-law that it's, you know, benefiting. But, but he does say in 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. I don't know if he's having some kind of a, uh, I don't know, a, a progression towards the one true and living God. But what I, I'm getting at in this scripture, what I, I it hits me as, other times in scripture, we see uh, the men of God taking advice or taking things into their own hands without seeking God first. And I was just thinking as we went through this passage, this is taking advice from, albeit it's an, his elder, his father-in-law, it is taking advice from a pagan yeah. without seeking the direct counsel of God. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but very, um, in verse 23, he says, he says, talk to your God about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and this is very common, you know, in the ancient world. <clears throat> that um you'll you'll find people who are you know I mean, they're polytheists they believe in a lot of gods right. and so yahweh would just be one of many other gods um but he might be the more powerful one but yeah you're right um moses and, and it doesn't spell it out but moses ought to have if he didn't he ought to have brought it before the lord um now, regardless of what happens here, it's always, it's always the right thing to bring it before the Lord. Always. Um, doesn't say that he didn't. It doesn't say that he did. It seems like he simply took the advice of his father-in-law. Um, but the one thing we, we know, um, or we should know, is that um, if he didn't seek the Lord and say, you know, what do you think, God? Is this a good idea? Uh, he should have. <laughs> right? He should have. And, you know, Moses and other people, other men of God, <clears throat> women of God, are um, a lot of times are not sinful in their taking advice or they're doing things in the sense of um, they don't have bad motives or anything like that. God oftentimes blesses those situations. But we can see examples where people do get in trouble when they don't. So if Moses did not seek God on this council, if he just took the advice of um, his father, um, his father-in-law, he, I would, I would say he should have, he should have, um, but God works in the midst of this and it does work out, uh, for the good. So I think that's probably about all we can say for sure. I mean, I can't think, and maybe somebody else can, or maybe it's somewhere else. I, I can't see anywhere where it says he didn't specifically seek the Lord or that he did. Um, it appears that he didn't. So he, he should have. He definitely should have. It wouldn't have hurt. It would have been the, the right thing to do. Um, but he does take this advice. He takes this advice from a, from a pagan polytheist. Um, but it's good advice. Um, it is good advice. And so um, he's going he's gonna to implement this. Now, what would have happened if Moses had kept doing what he was doing the way he was doing it? He had been overloaded. It uh, it had okay. got the best of him sooner or later. Yeah, he would have. He definitely would have been overloaded. Um, maybe we talk about burnout. Uh, here is a uh, ministry burnout. Maybe you've heard that term before. Uh, Moses yeah. certainly was working himself to the point where uh, he would have burnt himself out. And would he have been able to do anything else? That's that's the worst. <clears throat> the worst aspect is if you get tied down in these administrative burdens, and even though they're noble, and even though they're important, uh, they keep you from doing other things that are more important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Moses wouldn't have been able to do any. In fact, he wasn't doing anything else. He was simply, you know, being the judge and hearing cases and those kinds of things. When the in, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we have a situation where the early church has a problem. We have um, the neglect of Grecian widows, the Hellenistic um, Jewish folks there. Um, and 
there's a cry that goes out to the apostles. Does anybody remember offhand what the apostles say? The widows and orphans are being neglected. Yeah, but they say we can't leave the we can't leave uh, we can't leave the business to wait tables. Right. Yeah, they had more important things. There were, um, you know, the the prayer, ministering of the word, those kinds of things, and to provide for the physical needs, uh, which was important. I mean, this is not like it wasn't important, as you were saying, Tom. You know, there's important things. These things need to get done, whether it's administrative or whether it's feeding the widows and the poor and taking care of them. It's absolutely important. It's what God would want. But there are others who can do that. There's more important things um, that the apostles had to do. So we can kind of see a similarity, can't we? You see a similarity between what's going on here with Moses and what's going on in the early church, the apostles and the appointing of I think they're deacons, but whatever you think they are, uh, those servants in the uh, in the early church to uh, wait on tables to feed uh, the hungry. I think there's a similarity here, don't you? Yes. Yeah. So they they absolutely go along with what Tom was saying. There's important things, but then there's more important things, um, and we've got to be able to prioritize those things. Moses needed to prioritize those things. But if he had kept going on with doing what he was doing, he wouldn't have been able to do anything else. Now, what might the people, what might have happened with the people? Well, we know their history with grumbling at God. <laughs> yeah. uh, I started saying there might be an upright. <laughs> it, it wouldn't have been good. Yeah. Probably would have become bitter, don't you think? After yeah. having to wait, can you imagine? Can you imagine trying to wait all day and your court case doesn't get heard today? Have you ever been in court? You ever been in a long line at the DMV? Or what about the grocery store? You ever been in a line at the grocery store that's taken 15 minutes to get through? What do people tend to do? Sigh and start to talk under their breath. And yes. Yeah, mumble and complain. We might mm -hmm. say they were grumbling, <laughs> grumbling, right? So absolutely. Now, here's the question, and you've already answered it, but let's think about it again. Are the Israelites prone to complaining? Yes. Right. So this would have simply been another irritation that might have very well ignited more problems. I can't believe this. I've been waiting for three days. Moses still hasn't gone. Let's go do our own thing. Let's have an uprising. Let, you know what I mean? Like, you know that there are people like this. There are people just in the world complaining, complaining, complaining. So this would have probably been more fuel for the fire for those who are already grumbling and to raise up all these other people. So it would not have been a good situation to keep going the way it was going. Is there anything we can learn from this text? And if so, what is it? And this is what we'll end with tonight. Is there anything that we can learn from this text? And if so, what is it? What do you guys think? Don't try to do everything yourself. Mm, that is probably uh, a number one, right? Don't do, don't, don't do everything yourself. At least the big picture of this is you can't do it all. In fact, you know, Paul, you, we couldn't do it all ourselves, right? And so to try to do it all ourselves, we're really setting ourselves up for failure and possibly, possibly neglecting people who need help um, because we simply can't do everything. So absolutely. What else? What else can we learn from this text? Be, be willing to take responsibility if uh, asked. Ooh, all right. That's that's one. That's an important one. Be willing, especially if you're capable um, and you're a God fearing person and uh, trustworthy and all that good stuff. Yeah. Be willing to take responsibility. I think we'd have to say being able to listen to the wisdom of one's elders. Um, you know, it said in verse 24, he listened to his father in law and did everything he said. So. Mm. Paul wasn't maybe inspired. It was he 
he had the wisdom to listen to wisdom. Right. No, that's a good point. And even though we said that he, uh, if he didn't check with God, he should have, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't negate the fact that we today should be listening to wise people. And, and of course, we want to check it against what the Lord says and put it before him and, and all of that, those caveats. But we should absolutely, as you said, we should be open to and be seeking um, wisdom from, from those who are our elders, those, those people who have come before us and have life experience and, and biblical knowledge and have done things and, and all of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why, why in the world did God make elders part of the, uh, the structure of the church? They made them overseers. Somebody had to be in charge. That's true, but why are they why are they elders and not youngsters? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you know the answer. More knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Experience and knowledge and wisdom. Yes. Yeah. All of that stuff. That's right. You can't have an 18-year-old elder unless you're in the Mormon <laughs> congregations there. Um if you have an 18-year-old elder, you are in trouble. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a problem. They haven't lived. They haven't experienced life, and they haven't gone through tough times, and they haven't suffered, um, and they haven't gone through it and gained wisdom and hopefully godly wisdom and all those things. Absolutely. So they're elders because they're older, supposed to be wiser and all of that. That's not to say that some people get in those positions who shouldn't be, but we should be looking for older, uh, wiser men and women. We should be listening to our elders, we could say, um, both within the congregation, and those are male elders in the congregation, uh, but on the outside as well. Absolutely. Anything else we can learn from this text? I think these are all good things. Um, uh, another thing that goes along with what uh, was already mentioned of the idea that you can't do it yourself is um, uh, to delegate as a, authority. So we can't do it ourselves, but we um, maybe we can delegate some authority and, and delegate people to do things so that um, maybe lesser important jobs. We've got a very important job we've got to take care of, and there's other important jobs, but they're just not things that we have to do. Maybe we can delegate those to other people. All right, if there's no other thoughts, questions, comments, or concerns, good discussion tonight, guys. Good discussion. All right.